If you were to go to the website grassfedcentral.com, you would find right there at the top of the home page these words. If you like healthy eating and you like premium grass-fed beef, then you've come to the right place. <laughs> if you were to go to a particular joint replacement center that came up on a search I did uh, on Bing, it's in Washington, D.C., at a hospital there, an orthopedic hospital, you would find on that home page, you've come to the right place. If you were to go to the website for a tree and land development company in Sebring, Florida, and I happen to come across that website as well, you would see on the home page, having tree trouble? You've come to the right place. And as we, we read our text this morning, which we're going to do in just a moment, we could say of Jesus looking for someone who cares in a world where sometimes it's hard to find someone who cares. You've come to the right place. Our text, verses 24 to 30, why don't we look over that and see how Jesus is the right place to go when you have cares. We read, and from there, and that's talking about from the Galilee region where they were around the Sea of Galilee. From there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit uh, heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So he goes to this region of Tyre and Sidon, and those were two Gentile cities. He now was in Gentile area. And they're on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's about a two-day journey from where he left from, around the Sea of Galilee. Two-day journey back then. It's probably, I don't know, in a car, probably. I have no idea, an hour, two hours or something. But it was uh, uh, two days of walking to get there back in those days. Uh, we aren't told why he went there. He had his reasons. He goes into a house. We aren't told whose house it is. Apparently, he knew somebody who knew somebody, or when he showed up, somebody knew who he was and invited him in for a place to, to hang out. But we aren't told those things, and they really aren't essential to the story. There's little questions that might come up while you're looking at it. But while there, he hopes to avoid the crowds, and that might be the reason that he went there. Because everywhere he went, you remember, he and his disciples went across the sea and were trying to find a place where they could get away from the crowds because the crowds had been pressing upon them and what happened, the crowds could see them from the shore, ran along, got there ahead of where they, where they were going, got there ahead of them, and were waiting when they got there and that's when he fed the 5,000. So now he goes off to this Gentile region, goes into a house, hoping to not be seen by anybody. It sounds like he wants a little R&R &R because Jesus, while he is God in the flesh, he is God in the flesh. <laughs> when he became a man, he didn't become Superman, didn't need sleep, didn't need food or anything like that. He became a man like any other man. He became a human and dealt with life the way we deal with life. And so it seems he was 
uh, maybe wanting to get a little R&R when he went off to this Gentile region and went into this house. But his, rep, his reputation precedes him. Even in Gentile regions, they've started hearing about him apparently because this woman knows of him, knows he's come to town and comes and falls at his feet. And she is desperate. And we can understand her grief. We can understand her desperation because back at home, her daughter is possessed by a demon, by an unclean spirit, it says. And that would have probably involved, if it was the same kind of uh, symptoms that we see in other people in scriptures, throwing herself around, you know, just acting really crazy. And for any mother to see her daughter going through something like that, that's a terrifying thing. Terrifying thing to see a stranger going through something like that. But when it's somebody you love, she was in desperate need. And so she took this care that she had, this great care for her daughter, and she went to Jesus and she went to the right place. Her interaction shows us, gives us some lessons in how to take our cares to Jesus. There's some lessons about taking our cares to Jesus. These aren't all about how to do it, but they are all about doing it, taking our cares to Jesus. And we're going to, as we often do, <laughs> pull three lessons out of this text related to that. The first thing uh, I'd like for us to see here is that Jesus welcomes anybody. He welcomes anybody. We see this woman, I'm just going to, we'll read through the text again as we go here. From there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So he goes into this Gentile region and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet, uh, to know, yet he, yet he could not be hidden. And so like I said, his reputation precedes him. Not only this woman uh, is seeing him, but probably some other people, it sounds like, saw him slip into the house as well. Uh, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And that's what we want to really hone in on here. A Gentile, a Syrophoenician, that was when Rome took over that area. Uh, Syria and Phoenicia were two distinct places originally, but they had come together and, and blended into one community under Roman rule. So she was Syrophoenician, just to explain what that is. We don't need to say anything more about that. It doesn't really matter. The thing that's really important here, as far as I'm concerned, is that she was a Gentile. Because if Jesus had been following the oral traditions handed down by the rabbis, and remember we've recently seen him take those traditions to task in the last couple of passages we've looked at. If he were to follow those rabbinical traditions handed down from the elders from long ago, he would not have even acknowledged this woman as a Gentile. Now, those are not traditions handed down from God. They're traditions handed down from, uh, from men, the elders, that over the years, interpreting the word, coming up with applications of it and everything, pass those things along, and those things are treated as if they are scripture in terms of how, probably nobody says, oh, that's the word of God, just like Moses, writings of the Word of God, but in terms of how they, uh, they received them, they responded to them, and they felt compelled to obey them, they practically treated them like they were the Word of God. And if Jesus were to follow those things, he wouldn't have anything to do with this woman. And maybe she even knows that. Uh, you know, here comes this Jewish rabbi, and boy, I know Jewish rabbis don't want anything to do with a person like me, but I am desperate, 
and she falls. She doesn't just come in the house asking for help. She comes in the house and falls at his feet asking for help. Now Matthew's account of this tells us that the disciples were kind of going along with the oral tradition way of doing things. They were pleading with Jesus to send this woman away. And Jesus' response to that request, as Matthew tells us, could sound like he was going in that direction. As he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, I wasn't sent to the Gentiles. Now, the woman could have taken that as the way any other rabbi would, would uh, talk to her. But he doesn't act in that way. And I think what was going on here was they're in a Gentile region. Jesus knows that the gospel is eventually going to go to the ends of the earth. These disciples that he is training, who are going to stay behind when he has uh, died and risen and ascended back to the Father and are going to be carrying on this work, they're not just going to stay among the Jews, they're going to go to the Gentiles too. And so I think he's, I think when he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, I think he's saying that for the disciples uh, reason, disciples uh, benefit uh, as, as much as anything else, sort of setting them up uh, with, with what would be their understanding of things and making them think, yeah, I'm not going to have anything to do with these Gentiles. And then he turns around and has something to do with the Gentile. It's a real, I, I think it's a real dramatic way of making the point that what I have come to the earth to do is, is for the Jew first, yes, but also for the Greek, as Paul would write in Romans chapter 1. And so he gets their attention by doing this, and he does receive her, and he does hear her, and he does help her, as we saw when we read through the entire text. I was reminded as I was looking at this, Jesus receiving anybody, and, and this Gentile woman would have been viewed as very unclean. And I thought of a story that I heard years ago from Jim Simbel, a pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And I want to read, I, I found a transcript of this story that, that I had seen on a video years ago. I want to read it so I get it right. So this will take a few minutes, but it's, it's a great example of understanding that Jesus, Jesus welcomes anybody, anybody. He says, it was Easter Sunday, and I was so tired at the end of the day that I just went to the edge of the platform, pulled down my tie, and sat down and draped my feet over the edge. It was a wonderful service with people coming forward, the counselors were talking with these people. As I was sitting there, I looked up the middle aisle and there in about the third row was a man who looked about 50, disheveled, filthy. He looked up at me rather sheepishly, as if saying, could I talk to you? Now we have homeless people coming in all the time asking for money or whatever, so as I sat there I said to myself, though I am ashamed of it. What a way to end a Sunday. I've had such a good time preaching and ministering, and here's a fellow probably wanting some money for some wine. So he walked up. When he got within about five feet of me, I smelled a horrible smell like I'd never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when he got close, I, I would inhale by looking away, and then I'd talk to him, and then I'd look away to inhale, because I couldn't inhale facing him. I asked him, what's your name? David. Well, how long have you been on the street? 
six years. How old are you? 32. He looked 50. Hair matted, front teeth missing, wine of eyes slightly glazed. Where did you sleep last night, David? In an abandoned truck. So I keep in my back pocket a money clip that also holds some credit cards. I fumbled to pick out, pick one out thinking I'll give him some money. I wouldn't even get a volunteer. They're all busy talking with others. Usually we don't give money to people. We take them to get something to eat. I took the money out. David pushed his finger in front of me. He said, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus, the one you were talking about because I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. I completely forgot about David and I started to weep for myself. I was going to give a couple of dollars to someone God had sent to me. See how easy it is? I could make the excuse I was tired. There is no excuse. I was not seeing him the way God sees him. I was not feeling what God feels. But oh, did that change. David just stood there. He didn't know what was happening. I pleaded with God. God, forgive me, forgive me, please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm so sorry. Here I am with my message and my points and you send somebody and I am not ready for it. Oh God, something came over me. Suddenly I started to weep deeper and David began to weep he fell against my chest as I was sitting there. He fell against my white shirt and tie, and I put my arms around him, and there we wept on each other. The smell of his person became a beautiful aroma. Here is what I thought the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you, because this is why I called you where you are. This is what you are about. You are about this smell. Christ changed David's life. He started memorizing portions of scripture that were incredible. We got him a place to live. We hired him in the church to do maintenance and we got his teeth fixed. He was a handsome man when he came out of the hospital. They detoxed him in six days. He spent that Thanksgiving at my house. He also spent Christmas at my house. When we were exchanging presents, he pulled out a little thing and said, this is for you. It was a little white hanky. It was the only thing he could afford. A year later, David got up and talked about his conversion to Christ. The minute he took the mic and began to speak, I said, the man is a preacher. This past Easter, we ordained David. He is an associate minister of a church over in New Jersey. And I was so close to saying, here, take this, I'm a busy preacher. We can get so full of ourselves. That's what Jesus would do. That's what Jesus would do. Because Jesus welcomes anybody. Jesus welcomes anybody. And that means you, that means me. <laughs> no matter where we come from, no matter what we've done, no matter how we've failed and fallen, Jesus welcomes anybody no matter what anybody else thinks of us jesus welcomes anybody but let's take this application the way jim Sembla uh, showed us how to take it and say well if jesus welcomes anybody then i need to be ready to welcome anybody in the name of jesus because if i have the lord and you have the lord and people need the lord it doesn't matter who they are, what they look like, what their lifestyle is, how they smell or anything else. Jesus welcomes anybody. We, his people, uh, should do likewise. So that's the first thing. Jesus welcomes anybody. The second lesson we have in here is that Jesus receives a humble cry. Jesus receives a humble cry. Continuing there in... Uh, in verse 26, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, 
Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Now, Jesus, once again there, that sounds a little harsh when you read it, but as you watch him interacting with her and as you watch him uh, receiving her, hearing her, helping her when all is said and done, this seems more to me like he's, he's giving her a little bit of a test. Um, and he's also teaching his disciples because the Jews would view the Gentiles as dogs. Now we say, oh, but dogs are wonderful, so why is that an insult? And uh, the Gentiles might have thought the same thing. Gentiles kept dogs as pets, but the Jews did not. They did not at that time. Dogs were just wild animals and they were viewed as unclean, and so they were, the, the Gentiles were called dogs by the Jews. And so Jesus is saying the children are the Jews. This is, you know, I am the Jewish Messiah. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, and I've come to the Jew first, but we're going to learn also to the Greek. Um, and so the children of God, the chosen people, are Israel. So... I have come to do the, this ministry, the kind of ministry you're asking for, lady, but this ministry belongs to them. Why should I take the food that belongs to the children and give it to the dogs? And, you know, we could argue over whether Jesus was saying that and meant it exactly the way it sounded. I don't think he was because of how he goes on and treats her. Uh, he... It was not uh, unusual for Jesus to test the faith of somebody. And so I think that's what he's doing here. And then he's also, once again, setting the disciples up. The disciples are like, yeah, yeah, why should they get our food? You know, those dogs, why, we're, the, we're the children of God. Why should they get what he came to give to us? Only to find that she is going to get <laughs> what he came to give to them. So I think he's teaching them a lesson in that as well. And a lot of people might have been offended here, a lot of, especially in our day and age. They go, well, man, that's racist of you, Jesus. Because it's really hard not to get accused of that uh, in the current climate. Um, and, uh, uh, and she could have done that, but she didn't do that. I think he's probing and saying, how serious is she here about this? Is she one of the flippant crowds, all excited because I came to town and heard all these things about me? Or is she really, is she really seeking me? And so he throws that out there. And she had great faith and she had humble faith. Because look at how her humility shows up in here. First, she falls at his feet. That's a very humble posture. Secondly, she calls him Lord. That is a term that can mean anything from a term of respect to, uh, to Yahweh, God. And, uh, and, but it is a, a, it's a, at least a term of respect. So she falls at his feet, she calls him Lord. And then, and this is what we can really learn, she takes what she can get. Because her answer to him is, well, true, Lord, but when the children are eating that food at the table, and I'm paraphrasing, filling in the gaps, the crumbs fall on the floor and the dogs get the crumbs. She's essentially saying, I understand I'm the dog in this scenario. Can I have some of the crumbs? She's willing to take whatever Jesus wants to give to her. Totally humble. I, you know, I, I see these home advisor commercials on TV. Have you seen those commercials where one neighbor will say, I, I, I went and looked at one, and I'll just give it to you verbatim here. Uh, uh, this, this guy, this man says to his neighbor, they're out getting their mail at, you know, at the curb at their mailboxes, and, uh, and one man says, uh, I gotta get my roof repaired. Do you know anybody? 
And his uh, neighbor says, yeah, actually, I might. I, and then he interrupts him and says, great. Can you do a free background check on him for me? Give me some additional quotes. Research the average price of the job in this area and book the job for, you know, he gives him a date, you know, a range of dates that he can book the job for him. And the commercial goes on to say, hey, if you want that kind of service, come to Home Advisor. We give you those things. If your neighbors aren't going to give you those things. But do you ever approach God like that? Do you ever approach the Lord with that kind of attitude? I want you to do this, and I want you to do that, and I want you to do this other thing. And um, maybe not as crassly as that, but, but it boils down to maybe that's the way we're approaching Him sometimes. And that is not humility. That's not a humble heart that comes like that. I, this, this woman uh, goes before Jesus. She takes her cares to Jesus and, and takes them humbly to Jesus and is willing to put it in Jesus' hands and I'll take even the crumbs, Lord, even the crumbs. Rather than making all these grandiose demands and then getting angry with him when they don't turn out the way she wanted them to. Even the crumbs. I would say from this, talking about humility, um, and we are kids of the King, and we are joint heirs with Christ, and we're invited to come boldly to the throne of grace, and I understand all that, but there's a heart attitude involved that, that needs to be humble. And, and so I, I just put it out there like this. Go before the Lord as someone who's invited to go to the Lord, not as someone who deserves to be there and can make demands of him. Go with a sense of humility. Now, he has made you worthy to be there, but in and of ourselves, I'm talking about the kind of pride that says, hey, hey, I deserve to be here in your presence. Um, only because he's made you clean. And that's all because of him. And when you understand that, you come humbly to him and, and seek him and submit to his ways. So the Lord welcomes anybody and he receives a humble cry. The third lesson we see here is that Jesus cares for those who have cares. <laughs> he cares for those who have cares. And in verse, we see uh, verse 29 for this statement, you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. The child's not on the floor, rolling around, she's not throwing herself around the room, she is on the bed, relaxing, because she is back to normal. And Jesus didn't even have to go there. That's the kind of power he has. He didn't even have to go there. From a distance, he said, go home, the demon is gone. That's how much demons have to submit to him. He can just want it to happen, and it happens. He cares for those who have cares. Now this woman got her miracle. But let's not take this as a formula for how to get a miracle. Because we aren't always delivered by miracles. The verse I think of when I think about taking our cares to Jesus is 1 Peter 5, 7 which tells us we can cast all our cares on him because he cares for you. And that is true regardless of how he responds to the request that we have for him. Now, sometimes, and probably more in modern times than in times past, people are quick to think, Oh, I've prayed to him, I've prayed to him, I've prayed to him. I don't get what I want, so therefore I don't believe in him anymore. 
you know, or, or I'm mad at him, or something like that. And, um, you know, that's just, the, the thing I always think about with that, and, and I've had times when I've gotten mad at the Lord. It's so stupid when I think about it, but I've had that emotion toward the Lord over things. But here's the thing, the problem is still there. <laughs> The problem is still there. So whether I'm trusting the Lord or whether I'm rejecting the Lord, the problem is still there. And the fact that we are told, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you, that doesn't necessarily mean, that's not saying this, cast all your cares on him and he'll take care of everything the way you want him to. I mean, the thing that I find is comforting about that opportunity is that the world can be a very cold place. Do you under, I mean, you've probably encountered this, probably have a handful of people in this world that you can be going through something and they really care. Have you ever been uh, trying to just unload some burden that's so heavy you can't keep it to yourself, like at work or something, and somebody says, uh, Somebody says, I, you know, I didn't come in here today to hear all your problems. I got my own problems. You know, you get that kind of response. The fact that the Lord cares for us and invites us to cast our cares upon him, you don't find that in too many people. And it's wonderful that we find it in the eternal Son of God. So we've always come to the right place when we take our cares to him because we go to the place that we've been invited to go to and cast our cares upon him. If we start looking for only the miracle, only the deliverance from what we're going through, and that's the only thing we'll accept, then we're gonna wind up disappointed and we may wind up bitter. I love the humility that this woman went to Jesus with. It was a humility that deferred to whatever crumb Jesus wanted to give her. He just happened to give her the whole enchilada. Go home, your daughter is, is well. You know, but she was submitted to him. She was humble before him. So she got a miracle. You and I may not. But hey, here's the thing. If you're going through a trial, and, and this is easy for me to say, I, I know going through trials myself that sometimes we come out the other end and we're like, oh yeah, all this stuff I learned all these years, why didn't I apply, apply that when I was going through the trial? It would have made it a lot better. <clears throat> but let me just say, biblically, that uh, your trial might be a test to prove your faith. Not that God needs proof. God knows your faith. But you can prove your faith for your own benefit. To realize, wow, the Lord is working in my life. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would have responded like that a year ago. And, and look now, this, this is the Lord working in my life. And it brings a sense of encouragement. Or your trial might be an instructor to grow you in your faith. So it might be a test to prove your faith. It might be an instructor to grow your faith. That you need to go through this thing to get out on the other end and have this kind of growth that the Lord is then going to use. Um, you know, I, I think if we all take a good, honest look at our lives, we can, we can look back at how uh, some of the things that, that beat against us, like the strongest storm imaginable, are things that made us stronger when all was said and done. Because we had to endure them. And, and grew our faith because we had to trust in the Lord as we were going through it. It's one thing to say, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord. And we sit there and go, amen, I trust in the Lord, I trust in the Lord. 
but it's kind of like patience. You, you have to, you, you learn patience by having to wait. If you never have to wait for anything, you never really have learned to be patient. And you learn faith by having to trust, by having to endure. And so, you know, whatever trial you might endure now or in the future, it could be a test to prove your faith, it could be an instructor to grow your faith, or it might be a testimony for somebody else's faith. It's an opportunity to let your life display how God can get you through something and bring you out the other side of it. And that faith that you have through that trial could speak volumes to somebody who's watching you, maybe even from a distance. So the Lord will use our trials. If he doesn't just you know, give us the miracle, take the problem away, then he's got a purpose for the problem. He's got a purpose for our enduring the problem. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. He cares for those who have cares. You know, some people get martyred for their faith. They die for their faith. You look at that and say, how could the Lord let that happen? And yet we know from Scripture that they are going to get crowns and rewards for that in eternity. They're going to make everything in this life pale in comparison. And those wouldn't be available to them if they didn't go through that martyrdom. The Lord has so much of a broader perspective than we do. He, he knows the end from the beginning. And he knows his own purpose, which is hidden to us so often. But Jesus cares for those who have cares. So when you take your cares to Jesus, you've come to the right place. And we've looked at three lessons this morning uh, related to that. Lesson number one, Jesus welcomes anybody. He'll welcome us, and he would also call on us to welcome others in his name. Uh, lesson two, Jesus receives a humble cry. So act like you're invited into his presence. Don't go storming in like, okay, I got a problem here. I want to talk to the manager. You know, kind of, kind of prayer. Uh, go with humility. And, uh, and then lesson three, Jesus cares for those who have cares. So cast all your cares upon him. And even if it doesn't look like anything is happening to make them better, just keep casting those cares upon him. It keeps you in contact with him. It keeps you trusting in him. It keeps you hoping in him and waiting on him. And those are all good things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the fact that you care for us and you care for what we go through. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the psalmist who said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him and and uh, Lord in the grand scheme of things I mean if, if we go up a couple thousand feet in a in an airplane uh, we might not even be able to see humans walking around down on the ground that's that's how small we are in this not only in this earth but but then in the universe in everything you've created and yet Lord you care for us individually um, that, that is mind-boggling if we just stop and think about it. I pray, Lord, that these lessons we've looked at today, that these will uh, encourage our hearts at, toward just trusting in you more and more. And we thank you, Lord, that if nobody else cares, you do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.